We all face difficult times. Every individual that is here, you've already faced difficult circumstances, and we know that down the road we'll face difficult circumstances again. But there is not a moment in time, even in the trying times when in the midst of it I've asked where God was, and I've always looked back. And even in that moment when I said, God, where are you? I knew he was there. Aren't you grateful and thankful that no matter what we walk through, the Lord is present with us. He is so faithful, and he is so good to us. Again, I know I remind you about this every Wednesday night, but I do want to remind you, if you didn't get a bulletin from Sunday, uh, there are a few left out in the foyer that you can grab. Again, it has the updated prayer list on the back, um, and also all of the things that we are doing inside so that you can keep up to date uh, with the few weeks that are ahead of us. So please, if you didn't get one, make sure to grab one. I um, do want to let you know that uh, we'll be having uh, or we'll be hosting GW, as GW Long, if I can get it out, um, not this coming up Sunday, but the following Sunday for their baccalaureate service um, at 4 o'clock, and we'll have that in lieu of our normal evening service. So I encourage you guys to come out, um, even if you don't have anybody that is there, uh, with the seniors who will be graduating, but since it's here at our fellowship, I encourage you to come out and just support GW Long, support those kids um, as they celebrate baccalaureate and as we celebrate the Lord, uh, that we're able to love on them, the parents. Um, there may be individuals, they haven't darkened the door of a church in years, but they'll come for the baccalaureate service because their kids are here. And, hey, if we put ourselves in those places and just say, let God be God. He knows what doors he'll open. So I encourage you um, to just come and let's support them. Um, but uh, just be in prayer for that. Also, our kids will be headed to kids camp um, the first part of June. If you parents uh, haven't uh, signed your kids up yet, uh, early registration is still available. Uh, make sure to see Matt or Amanda and they can get that information to you. Um, I forget the date that I told you on Sunday, um, so I'm not even going to try to remember. I think it was like the 17th. I'm not for sure. Matt can tell you the possible, uh, the, the exact date, but I know that after that date, cost will go up $10, so just want to remind you about that. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 9 through 13 tonight. Romans 8. Verses 9 through 13. As I stated before, this chapter is one of my favorite in the whole Bible. And the reason is, is the whole chapter deals with our life as believers in Christ in the Spirit. We live in the Spirit. Now, people who are not believers, they don't really understand the magnitude of what that statement means. Because they're not living in Christ, therefore they're not living in the Spirit. But as Christians, as disciples of Christ, we understand the magnitude of the statement living in the Spirit, especially being Pentecostal. So tonight we're going to continue in this journey. Tonight we're really looking at the fact that these verses speak that as believers in the Christ, living life in the Spirit, that we do so with a different quality of life. A different quality. In fact, Paul says this in Romans 8, in the first part of verse 9. He says, you are not in the flesh. If we're a Christian, if we're a disciple of Christ, Paul says we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Father, lead us tonight in your word. Lord, we ask that and we pray that, that you may continue to perfect the work that you have begun in us by faith for your glory, for your honor, and for the advancement of your will in and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we think about that first part of verse 9, and I've got a lot tonight, so hang with me. You can look on you version as you saw the first slide, and it has the notes, and it kind of will help you stay connected. But 
statement we just read in the first part of verse 9 is a very profound statement regarding our lives as believers. There is nowhere in Scripture that we can find, I believe, a clearer indication that Holy Spirit enters a person's life at the moment of conversion. At that very moment of conversion, when an individual gives their life to the Lord, and what Jesus told Nicodemus becomes a reality in them of John 3, they become born again. At that very moment, the Spirit of God lives and resides within that person. As Christians, now we understand from a strictly physical standpoint, we all live life like every other human being. That is, we eat, which we just did, right? We sleep, which hopefully some of us are going to do here in maybe in the next couple of hours or so, depending on if you have kids, small kids, uh, maybe you'll get there in a little while. We all need exercise. I don't know if any of us would say amen to that. And so on. There are things that we all have to do as physical human beings. The difference comes from the fact that because we are now in Christ, that is to say we are born again, we are not bound to our flesh nor characterized by our flesh from a spiritual standpoint. As a born again child of God, my flesh does not define who I am. My relationship with Christ defines who I am. And that life now in Christ is lived by the power of Holy Spirit. We no longer belong to the flesh. And we understand that when the Bible uses that term flesh, that it is referring to the old sinful life, the life that was lived for self, the life that was lived in pursuit of the world, which excluded God. But we now live life in the Spirit. And as a direct result of Christ's saving work on the cross and through his resurrection, this is our new reality. And it is a growing, flourishing, dynamic reality that doesn't grow old, but only what? It grows new each and every day. This is our reality now because we have decided to live for Christ above everything else. And now because we are in the Spirit, which Paul says here in Romans 8, verse 9, through being born again, we have a different quality of life from a life lived in the flesh. It's different. There's a different quality. Because the presence of Holy Spirit in our lives as Christians is the normal. And not only the normal, but the necessity in order for us to walk in a manner that pleases our Father. As Christians, we now live a new life in Christ through the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit because there is no other way. We cannot live victorious in this life without living it by the leading and the empowerment of Holy Spirit because it's Holy Spirit's presence that enables our lives to be vitally connected to God. It's not just a one-time experience that we have that Acts chapter 2 speaks of. That they were filled in the upper room and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That it's some this dynamic explosion verbally and then that's it. That's not living in the Spirit. In fact, it's like this one grandmother said to her son that was filled with the Spirit one night. She says, it's not about how high you jump, it's about how straight you walk. Thank God for the jump and the shout, amen? Because it encourages, it strengthens individually, but also it strengthens corporately. But it's not about how high we jump, it's about how straight we walk. And Holy Spirit is vital. Why? Because he vitally connects us to God. In fact, that's what being in the Spirit means. Being vitally connected with God. Look at what Romans 8 and the last part of verse 9 says. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, 
he does not belong to him. As Christians, we live through the enablement and leading of Holy Spirit. That's what it means to say there's no way that we can say or we can't call Jesus Lord Adonai unless the Spirit resides in us. He is what gives testimony to the authenticity of our faith. Life in the Spirit is a life of different quality. The phrase in the Spirit simply means that it is a life that is made possible only because the Spirit of God has come into our lives and He infills us. That's exactly what the word dwell means. It means to reside. And notice in verse 9 again, and we're going to spend a little time on this verse before we move on to the others. But notice in verse 9, Paul says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, when we look at that word if, we would kind of think that there's a question there. That Paul is saying, well, if the Spirit dwells in you, you're... but really, what is being stated here is since. Indeed, the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's the sense of what Paul is saying. Since. That word dwell is, it's important for us to understand so that we can grasp and have a proper understanding of what it means to live in the Spirit. Dwell indicates that Holy Spirit is not just an occasional visitor. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe after you were baptized in the Spirit. Now, let me, we understand this. John 20 speaks of the conversion experience. John 20 speaks of when Jesus, after his death and his resurrection, the disciples are shut up in a room because they're scared to death that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin and all, they're going to come and do to them what they've done to Jesus. So they're shut up, hiding. Jesus comes walking in the room, right? He breathes on them, and what does he say? Receive the Spirit. At that moment, they receive the benefit of his death and his resurrection, the new conversion, the Spirit of God residing in their lives. Because what? Unless the Spirit is within us, we're not a child of God. Romans 8 verse 9 says that as soon as we confess Christ as Lord and Savior, our faith is authentic, the Spirit of God dwells within us. He takes up residence. And then we came to Romans, or I should say Acts chapter 2, and there is a fuller indwelling and expression of, of the Spirit in our lives, of Him taking up residence. He's not just an occasional visitor. Holy Spirit doesn't come on us just when we come to church on Sunday, right? We don't just speak in the Spirit when we come to church on Sundays and we're with the community of faith. No, Holy Spirit is not just an occasional visitor. He has taken up residence in our lives. That's what that word dwell means since Holy Spirit dwells in you. And so in looking at verse 9 and seeing what Paul says, let me ask you a question. And it may seem at first that it doesn't go along, but I promise that it does. But have any of you ever heard the statement before, if you shoot at nothing, you'll hit it every time, right? Right? There's no target. If you're shooting at nothing, you're going to hit it every time. And when we boil it all down, that's the real question regarding our spiritual lives. And if you've got the Version app up and you're looking at the notes right now, that statement that I put there, you'll notice how I spelled spiritual. That is capital S-P-I-R-I-T dash in lowercase U-A-L. Because that's exactly what it is. The Spirit dwelling and residing in us. When we boil it down, the real question regarding our spiritual lives is, what are we aiming at? What are we aiming at? We come to chapter, or we come to verse 9 tonight. We've looked at the first eight verses, the past, what, two Wednesday nights, and there was one stuck in there from district council I was away. 
But when we look at Romans 8, it really speaks to what are we aiming at with our lives? What's our pursuit? How are we living? Because Romans chapter 8 teaches the potential of the life of those who walk in the empowerment and leading of Holy Spirit. Potential. The potential of our lives in Christ through the indwelling power of Holy Spirit, through His empowerment and through His leading. And I use the word potential because we can have all the ability in the world, but if we don't do anything with it, it's worthless to us. Romans chapter 8 teaches, as we've already looked at, that we can live in the knowledge that we are free from condemnation. That was verse 1. No more condemnation. We're no longer condemned. Oh, the enemy likes to come and condemn us, doesn't he? Remind us of what we were. Or remind us of our faults. But Romans 8 verse 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, why? Because there's a new law at work. The law of the spirit of life. Not only does it tell us that, but it also teaches us that we can live as people set free from the power of sin that leads to death. That's what verse 2 said. We can also know that the requirements of God's law is fulfilled in us through what Christ has done for us. That's verse 3 and verse 4. And because of that truth, because there's no condemnation any longer for us in Christ... Because we have been set free from the power of sin that leads to death. And because the requirements of God's law have been fulfilled in us through Christ's sacrifice. Because of those truths, we now can walk according to the spirit rather than according to the flesh, verse 4 says. And because we walk in the enablement of Holy Spirit, we can set our minds on the things of Holy Spirit rather than on the things of the world and live life's characterized by peace verse 5 6 and 7 because life in the spirit has a lot to do with our mindset what are we aiming for whatever our minds are set on will determine in a very large degree how we're doing in our christian walk and then when we come to verse 8 because we are walking in the spirit and we have a mindset on the spirit verse 8 tells us that we can live lives that are pleasing to god Know that he is pleased with us. These are just a few. Just a few of the aspects of the spiritual life that God has prepared for us through his son and our savior. In fact, Jesus referred to this spiritual life for those who put their faith in him as Lord and savior as a life lived abundantly. John Chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life. And not just kind of any kind of life. I've come to give you life to the fullest extent. That's only possible through the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit. What are we aiming for? What are we aiming for? Romans 8 focuses on the Spirit-empowered life that all believers now live in Christ over the pool of sin, our flesh. Because that sinful nature that doesn't dominate us any longer as Christians, it still pulls on us. Doesn't it? It still pulls. And we overcome it not by just willing ourselves to overcome. We overcome by surrendering ourselves to the work of Holy Spirit. Because He's the one who leads. He's the one who empowers. He's the one who enables us. Romans 8 does not teach us to make concessions or accommodations for sin. That's why we look in our world today and people say, you know what, I want to keep the lifestyle that I like and I want to have God. But that's impossible. You can't. And people are following a false narrative. They are following a false gospel that has no power except to make them feel good about themselves. But in the end, what's that going to benefit them? It isn't. Because Romans 8, nor does the Bible anywhere else teach that we are to make allowances for our flesh. Because we cannot remain true to the teachings of Christ while at the same time adjusting our theology to accommodate the presence of sin. The old man, the old person. 
And the teachings of Romans 8, it centers on a life in Jesus Christ that is enabled by the power of Holy Spirit to change its practices to line up with good biblical theology. God's Word. It's Holy Spirit that enables us to do that. Because how can I, how can you, how can we bear witness of the truth of God if we're not living and growing in good, biblical, sound theology? Good biblical theology is not hate speech. The world would like to make us think that it's hate speech. That because I follow the Bible and their lifestyle doesn't line up with the Bible, and how can it? If they're living in the flesh, it can. If I'm living in the flesh, my life isn't lining up with the Word of God. I'm in opposition to God. Why? Because we just talked about last week that, what, the flesh, it can't please God. It doesn't even have a mind or will to do so. It's impossible. So the world says it's hate speech when we live according to good biblical theology. But the only time the Word of God can become in us and through us hate speech is when we take on a pharisaical attitude, condemning someone while we're doing the same things. It can become hate speech because it's not living within us and we're using it improperly. And it can also become hate speech if I do what Jesus tells us not to do, don't judge. Which means what? We talked about that, you know, a few weeks back when we looked at the Sermon on the Mount. There's only one righteous judge that can judge the heart rightly, and that's God himself. God hasn't called us to be uh, his jury. He hasn't called us to be his judge. He hasn't called us to be the prosecuting attorney that convicts, condemns, and sentences people. He has called us to be spirit-empowered, informed believers who can speak the truth of his word in its spirit because we are living proof of its reality. Romans 8 teaches about a spirit-empowered life. That's what we're looking at, a life of different quality in the spirit. It teaches us that if we are in Christ, and the proof and the sealing of our faith is the abiding presence of Holy Spirit. In other words, we have Holy Spirit, and we become the temple of Holy Spirit, the residence of God. And since Holy Spirit has taken up residence in our lives and we are in Christ, he goes on and Paul says this in verse 10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. In you. Now notice that. Dwells. Not an occasional visitor, but an individual has taken up residence. When we look what Paul is saying here in verse 10, especially about righteousness. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. You know, we can't be indifferent to the importance of righteousness in our daily lives. And that word righteousness, we know what it means. It means to have right standing with God. And the only way we can have right standing with God is through Christ. And the only way that we can walk in the way is through the enablement of Holy Spirit. In fact, we know when we read on a couple of chapters further into Romans, Romans 12, I I alluded to this before, but I want to bring the scripture out again. Romans 12 verses 1 through 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren... By the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. This is about walking in right standing with the Father. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Because it is by Holy Spirit that the indwelling presence of the risen Christ is conveyed and grown in our lives. We don't make it happen. We yield, and Holy Spirit is the one who grows the character of Christ within us. Holy Spirit is the one who infuses spiritual life in us. In us, as we read the word, that it's more than just pages or or printed words on a page, but it's God's living and powerful word that he is the spirit of truth, brings into our hearts so that we can be a workman that is not ashamed, 
but we can rightly divide the word of truth. In other words, we can rightly interpret what is there. And it's not going to mean to you one thing and one thing to me. It's going to mean the same thing. And we can rightly interpret it, but it doesn't stop there. He enables us to rightly apply it. Not just hearers, but doers of the word that we can express and live out living faith. That works for God's glory and the advancement of his will. Because Holy Spirit is the one who infuses spiritual life in us. 1 Thessalonians verse, chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what Paul says here. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And that word sanctification, we know it means to be set apart. Set apart as holy. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. I pray that prayer every day. That is, Lord, teach me by your Holy Spirit to know how to keep this vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of the flesh. Lord, help me. Help me. Because Holy Spirit gives life to our lives right now, that moment, so that we are enabled to serve God. It is impossible to serve God without the presence of Holy Spirit. Because He is the one that makes us alive. Not by telling our dead bodies. We don't make ourselves alive by telling our dead bodies to be alive. I can't tell my dead body to be alive. You now we're, we're speaking in a spiritual sense. Understand here. But rather it's by letting Holy Spirit do to us what he did for Jesus. What did Holy Spirit do for Jesus? Jesus was dead physically. He was dead. There was no pulse. There was no breath. Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit came and he raised Jesus from the dead. And Paul teaches us the truth that if God's Spirit lives in us, which he does, then he who raised Christ from the dead is the same one who will also bring our mortal bodies to life. We have life because we have the life-giving Spirit within us. We have a new power, a new power at work. And I've heard many different individuals who have taught on this passage, and they all kind of, in different words, use kind of the same analogy. And that is that Holy Spirit, bringing it down to my level, I'm not going to say your level, I'll say my level. Your level may be higher than mine. But bringing it down to my level... Holy Spirit is an engine. He is an engine in, if you will, a vehicle that can make, or I should say, that can take us where God wants us to go. Now, we can have a pretty, whatever you want to use, gorgeous, beautiful frame, painted, the latest body style and all, but if it doesn't have an engine... What is it? Useless. <laughs> we can sit in it and look good, but it sure ain't going to get us anywhere, is it? It won't get us anywhere. And trying to live a Christian life without yielding and surrendering to the power and the work of the Holy Spirit is like having a sports car, and instead of being inside driving it, we're pushing it. I mean, really, if you thought about it, it's the truth. It's a lot harder than what it needs to be because Holy Spirit really is the engine that makes the car, the vehicle go and will take us where God wants us to be. But many are trying to push the car around <laughs> when God wants us to let the engine do what it was made to do, get us where he wants us to go and to be. Why? Because, what does it say? It is the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead that dwells in you. Therefore, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit 
who dwells in you. Holy Spirit makes the engine go. Without him, it doesn't go. Paul goes on and he says in verse 12, he says, so then, brothers, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How do I deal with my flesh? How do I deal with that pull? You know, I've stated this before, when somebody cuts me off. Or when somebody's driving slow in the passing lane. <laughs> and we really are doing the speed limit. <laughs> you know, I know that's comical stuff. But I'm, I'm just saying when certain things, somebody treats us or uses us or abuses us. What do I, how do I deal with the flesh? It's more than just biting my tongue. It's a whole lot more than just bite my tongue and, hey, I'm not going to say it. The Word of God says I have the ability through the Holy Spirit to not even want to say it, to not even want to act in that way. I have that ability through Him, through Him and dwelling in my life. Because what Paul says here in verses 12 and 13, not only do we have Holy Spirit, which we do because he dwells, he takes up residence in our lives. He's not just an occasional visitor. He is our constant companion. Not only does Paul say that we have Holy Spirit, Paul says that if we live in Holy Spirit, he has us. Holy Spirit has us. You know, as Pentecostals, we can get the cart before the horse. And we can think we have Holy Spirit. It's all about the tongue. It's all about the outward expression. It's all about this. It's all about that. What I can do because I have Holy Spirit. No. It's so much more than just the tongue. And I love the gifts. And the gifts are important. They're not functioning in the church. The church is not functioning according to God's will. And not only is it not functioning according to God's will, we're not able to relate with one another the way God wants us to relate with one another, to benefit one another for his glory, nor are we able, because the gifts aren't just so they can be used in the church and the church can grow in that sense spiritually. The gifts really find their application outside the doors in the world, connecting people with the good news of Jesus Christ. With all that aside, it's not that we have Holy Spirit. It's the fact that He has us. And that's what verses 12 and 13 speak to. The power, the enablement comes from Holy Spirit having us. Our lives, our actions, our words, our thoughts. Paul says in Colossians 1, verse 29, For this purpose I also labor, striving according to His power, which works mightily within me. His power. That's the presence of Holy Spirit. I don't just have Holy Spirit. No, He has me. He has me. Because let's remember, as those in Christ, Romans 8 teaches about a Spirit-empowered, informed life that has lived in a different quality as a new creation. A different quality. He is the one that makes it a different quality. Christ, the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit, makes my life of a different quality. And Paul lays out before us in these two verses the truth that there are two different directions in life that we can take in the end result of each choice. We can choose of our own free will. Now, I know there's individuals out there that believe that uh, free will takes God's sovereignty away, but that's not true. Actually, our free will speaks to God's sovereignty because God in his sovereignty has chosen to give us free will. We wouldn't have it if he didn't give it. So he's given that free will. And when we look here, we have a choice. 
of our own free will as Christians to do what is uncharacteristic of a life lived in Christ. That is, as verse 12 says, to live in the flesh. Every one of us have that ability. Every one of us have that ability to choose to live in the flesh. And Paul emphasizes that we, we are going to toll. I don't know that we use that word a lot. It's more of, a, I guess, a King James version or New King James. That toll, it just means, you know, there's a struggle there. But that we must do it with the energy that God works within us. And that energy is not a thing. That energy is a person, and not just any person. He's the third person of the triune Godhead. God living inside us. So we have a power that is beyond and out of this world that enables us to not just bite our tongue, but conquer the sin and the flesh. Because notice Paul, notice what he says in verse 13. He says we need to put to death the deeds of the body. We need to put it to death, kill it. But notice he emphasizes how we do that. We don't will it to happen. We don't make it happen. How do we put to death our flesh, the deeds of the flesh? It's done by Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yielding to Holy Spirit. And we understand that Paul is not speaking to a passive action. But he is aggressively encouraging us to actively kill the sinful deeds. A thought, a word in our spirit, whatever it is. Well, we take it captive, make it under submission to the Lordship of Christ, but through the Holy Spirit, what do we do with it? We kill it. Do away with it. And that activity of killing the flesh, doing away with it, is spirit-empowered, and it is spirit-motivated. Sanctification, Paul is saying, is not a luxury. It's not a luxury that we can have or only a few have. No, it's not a luxury, but it is a necessity that is cultivated in our lives by Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit alone. The work of sanctification. He's still working on it to make me what I ought to be. And it's not about trying to will myself to do something. It's about surrendering my will to Holy Spirit because he's the one that's going to make it happen. You say, well, you know what? I've tried. Don't stop. Don't stop. Well, I prayed. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Well, I've, I've done this. Keep on reaching Keep on seeking him. Don't stop. Don't stop. And ask him, Lord, is there anything there that's in the way? Through Holy Spirit, help me to see. Because I know it's through his power and his power alone as I yield to his in working and leading that I'm not just going to bite my tongue. I'm going to put these things to death. I'm going to slay them because they don't own me. I'm yours, and you're mine. And where God resides in the spirit of truth and holiness resides, sin cannot reside. Now, I'm not saying we're not going to mess up. There's one thing, you know, I've, I've, you know my dad and, and other individuals that I've talked to, as I've told you, I'm fourth generation, AG, fourth generation Pentecostal, you know, and used to preach everything was a sin. Y'all remember? If you're smiling or having fun, and you, you think I'm exaggerating, talk, talk to some individuals. If you're smiling or having fun, well, let's, we need to talk and have a council session because there's something going on inside of you. You think I'm joking, but <laughs> I mean, really, it was that way. And, and what did it create? It created such a spiritual paranoia that if I just slipped up a little bit, I thought that was it. God smacked me and I'm done. So, you know, as Pentecost, sometimes we can go to that one end of the spectrum where we create spiritual paranoia. It's not once saved, always saved. Neither is it that I'm paranoid if I'm right with God or not. It's 
not about being proud, but neither is it living beneath the means of Christ in me. What are we aiming at as I close and ask Kip to come back? What are we aiming at? As disciples of Christ, we have an obligation, Paul says. The obligation is to daily seek and surrender to the enablement of Holy Spirit because he's the one that produces the good works in us. And we know that Paul has said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself it is a gift of God. So there is no patting myself on the back when I do good. It's the way we're supposed to act. Not as a result of my works, verse 9, so that no one may boast, but verse 10, for we are God, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. In other words, we're God's masterpiece, and he's still working in us to make us that. That's what that word workmanship means. It means masterpiece. It shouldn't produce pride within us, but it should produce assurance. Philippians 1, 6, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work will perfect it into the day of Jesus. His return. The Lord has good works prepared for us. He has the desire and the ability to prepare for us those good works. And best of all, He has promised to bring it all together to do what? To accomplish what He has determined. Our responsibility is to let Him. That comes through seeking Him in the Word every day. It comes through seeking Him in prayer every day. It comes through Holy Spirit. I live by your enablement. I want to honor Christ in all that I do. I want to be a living epistle. It's not about me trying harder. It's about me surrendering to the empowerment and leading that you bring into my life. We must let him. And if we do, then we are able to live life of different quality. If we don't, then we're giving ourselves to the flesh. Then a death-like, miserable existence. What am I giving myself to? What am I not aiming for? What am I aiming for? That Holy Spirit control and lead and empower and guide me. Father, Lord, as we yield our hearts and our lives to you, Lord, we know that you have given us everything that we need as pertains to godliness. Lord, your word clearly states. And Lord, it's not philosophies, it's not ideals. Lord, it is... The, a person. It is the person of Holy Spirit who lives and resides in us, enabling us to be living epistles, to not just bite our tongue or, or swallow our words, but literally to put that old self to death, the works of the flesh to death. It is by Holy Spirit that we're able to do that. The question is, what are we aiming for? Oh, Lord, help us. Holy Spirit, help us. Lord, as we normally do it here, here at the end, just as a point of application, can we stand together?